2015. Please welcome to the stage Miss Jessica Lay Jones. Good morning, Sophia. It's great to be here. Just a quick disclaimer before we start. I do not represent the views of Sony. These are my own views. It just so happens that I work at Sony. So if anyone is not confident in anything I've got to say, please don't write to Sony. Please just contact me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I think I'm up there and, and we can talk about it. Right, Industry 4.0. In the UK, we call it the, the fourth industrial revolution. Now, when we hear about Industry 4.0, we think about technology. We think about artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these really exciting things. And that's what the hype is all about. But technology is really just an enabler. And so what I want to explore with you over the next 10 minutes, 10 minutes or so is the idea that Industry 4.0 is more an evolution of human behavior and less a technological revolution. So let's start with us, consumers. So what we want as consumers is changing. Henry Ford once said that his customers could have a car in any color they wanted, so long as it was black. And that was the birth of mass manufacture. These were the kinds of production techniques that enabled very, very high-end, luxurious, usually non-essential goods to become available to the majority. But people don't want that anymore. We don't want to have the same things as, a, as our neighbors. I don't want to wear the same t-shirt as somebody else that I know. What we're searching for as consumers is a personalized experience. And what that translates to in manufacturing is this idea of mass customization. So it's this elusive concept of batch size one. So you make any product of any level of variation. I make a phone one minute, then I make a a camera, then I make a TV, the next. You can make it anywhere, anytime, in a single batch, and make more money than you did when you mass manufactured a product. Now that sounds like a really tall order, but for some of the manufacturers who are making this work, they are looking at things like systems of mass configuration. So they're getting much closer to their customers, they're anticipating all of the different possibilities that their customers may want, and then they're using enabling technology like we talked about, flexible robotics, additive layer manufacturing technology, in order to deliver a high degree of controlled product variation. Now, 2019 is said to be the year of balance. And so what that means is whilst we are on a quest for a personalized experience, what we also want, in addition to our individuality, is to be responsible consumers. So you'll notice that there are lots more millennials around. Uh, I happen to be one of them, barely, I'll admit. Um, and as millennials, what we really care about is the planet. We want to ensure that the legacy that we leave behind for future generations is a positive one. And what we want more than anything from the brands that we buy and the manufacturers that sit behind those brands is to know that they reflect our values. And this is a massive cultural shift for manufacturers. This is going away from the idea of compliance, ticking a box to say, yes, I sourced this component from a green supplier, to moving towards a system where we take a whole systems view, right? So we consider the product, not just at the start of its life cycle to the end, but actually what happens once we dispose of that product? How can we move to a system where not only do we not damage the environment, but actually we benefit the environment? So this is regenerative thinking. And it's interesting, technology um, actually promotes degenerative consumerism. So if you think of a mobile phone, this thing was manufactured to probably last for 10 plus years. But with the frequent software updates and the aggressive marketing 
The reality is this thing will become obsolete in 12 to 18 months. I mean, that one already is, I'll be honest. And so do we ever think about what happens at the end, w when that product get dis gets disposed of? Do we think about the precious platinum and gold content? There are companies out there who recycle it, but it's an afterthought. And what we want to see is manufacturers treating this as a priority. You know, I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, you just look at the news, all the stuff about plastic, single-use plastic. So supermarkets are using less plastic. School kids in the UK are going on strike because of the plastic in the oceans. Bars are banning the use of plastic straws. This is the stuff we care about, so we want to see this reflected. But also, for anybody who has millennial children, or maybe you're a millennial yourself, you'll know better than anybody, we want things now. We want things on our terms, and to be honest, it doesn't matter if it's outside what we can afford. We'll find a way. We want stuff now. So there is a very on-demand culture with consumerism. Now, let's explore this a little bit more. So um, think about, just let, so let, let's go back to the, the mobile phone example again. So 10 years ago, you would probably, it would be quite common to purchase one of these things on contract, right? So you'd pay a monthly fee which would be your service charge plus a proportion of the cost of the phone. That was quite normal. What wasn't normal is to maybe purchase a car in the same way. Cars were always seen as a status of wealth, a symbol of wealth or a symbol of status. But these days, that's changing. So now 80% of new cars are purchased on some kind of finance deal. And that is changing the landscape for manufacturers. I mean, you take the German economy, for example. There are lots of high-end car manufacturers in the German economy. But we're not so interested in the quality anymore. We're interested in newness. And we're interested with the service that goes with that newness. We're interested in having a hassle-free service agreement with our car where they'll pick it up and do the services, and we don't have to worry about any of it. So some of these higher-end manufacturers are now having to compete on the grounds of cost. They're looking at cheaper labor. They're looking at cheaper parts. But in the world of Industry 4.0, cheap ain't going to help you. It's not about efficiency. And so survival will not be guaranteed for those who are the fittest. Instead, survival will be granted to those who are most adaptable to change. Enter servitization. The idea that you take a traditional product, you add value to it, and you sell it as a service. So from a financial perspective, why sell something once when you can sell it every month and generate a predictable income? Sounds pretty good. Let's go a little step further than that. Because you're now closer to your customer, because you're selling to them more often, if you do things right, if you treat them well, you build a good relationship with that customer. And so you have more opportunities to upsell and on-sell. So you can sell more of your products and services to this customer. But don't forget, in the world of Industry 4.0, we have a lot of millennials who use social media, as do I. And so what you also get, again, if you treat that customer well, is access to a much broader network, probably a social network, of other customers who you can on-sell and upsell to. So Industry 4.0, again, is a total mindset shift. It's about moving away from making a physical thing that has a value and moving towards delivering a service, which probably includes physical things. They're never going to go away. But this service is of much higher value to the customer. It's more convenient. It solves their problem. And so the manufacturers who are going to survive in this revolution are the ones who can make that shift. OK, so with all of this external change in the external environment, it would be reasonable to expect that there would be the same, if not a greater amount of internal change. Now, as we know, technology and automation is going to replace jobs. These are typically the mundane, repetitive jobs. I'm going to pick a part up and put it in a circuit board. I'm going to spray paint a car chassis. 
perhaps it's a little bit more office-based, so I'm going to send an automated email, an escalation email to a different department. I'm going to generate an automatic invoice. All of these things are examples of automation, and automation will replace tasks in our day-to-day -day jobs. But research actually suggests that automation in manufacturing will have a net positive increase on employment. So it will create more jobs than it replaces. It's just that the types of jobs it creates will be different to those before. And they'll be different in a number of ways. They'll typically be higher value, higher skills, and therefore more highly paid. It's good for the economy. But also, they're likely to include a higher degree of creativity, thinking skills. So, what are we going to do as businesses about this? So you could say, fine, well, we'll just recruit a load of people with digital and creative skills, no problem. Well, I can certainly tell you in the UK that isn't possible because demand for these skills massively outstrips supply. So that isn't an option. Maybe that's only going to cover a small percentage of the skills that you need. Now, if you don't find these people, you're not going to be able to adapt. You're not going to be able to cope with some of the new technologies and the new ways of thinking that Industry 4 brings. So here's another solution. We retrain and upskill. In the UK, there's this horrible mentality that education must stop at 21. It's a tick box exercise. You get your degree. That's education done with. That's rubbish. It's a terrible idea. And we're starting to realize this in the UK. I mean, currently, if you graduate as a solicitor at 21, you're always going to be a solicitor. If you're a mechanical engineer, you're going to be working with gears and motors and greasy things, and you're never going to touch a circuit board or write a piece of code. That's rubbish. We need people with broader skills. And so in the UK, we're investing in apprenticeships. We're delivering radical reforms that see employers come together to define what the future of work looks like. Those employers create standards that we can train people to. And then they make a commitment to retrain their existing employees and take on new apprentices. And the obvious gain for doing this, the obvious positive, is that you're going to improve your organizational capability. You're going to become more valuable. But also, you're going to become more responsive to change. And finally, let's talk a little bit about innovation. So with all of this technology coming in, with the mundane tasks being taken away, people can focus on doing things that are more creative. Creativity breeds innovation. And if you can create a culture of innovation within your businesses, then you're likely to have a more sustainable future. The more opportunities you create, basic maths will tell you that you're going to have more opportunities that are going to result in something that's of high value to the business. So the final message that I really want to leave you with is that Industry 4 is much more about us as people. And when we look at our businesses and when we think about how we're going to tackle some of the challenges with Industry 4.0, we need to look more internally at ourselves and what we want. But also, we shouldn't be afraid of technology. Technology is an enabler. And the fantastic thing about it is it's allowing people to be more human. It's giving people the opportunity to do things that humans are supposed to do, not the boring, repetitive stuff. So Industry 4.0 is coming. It provides us with an opportunity to redefine our own possibilities and the possibilities of our industry. And so my question to you is, what are you going to do? Thank you very much.